Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Russell Matthews here, and there has been no shortage of news about the Canadian housing market since the beginning of the pandemic, and how it's seen some pretty substantial increases in most markets. And now it seems like every other day there's a different chief economist from a Canadian big bank coming out and bringing up their views on the housing market and what needs to be done to potentially slow this down. And now, one of the largest regulators in Canada when it comes to financial institutions says, hey guys, don't worry, we are going to step in. And there's even talk of the government releasing information about how they're going to try to sort of curb this growth and curb this affordability crisis. So in today's video, we're going to go over everything I just talked about and get into some of the details of what is actually going on. But before we do, make sure to check out the links in the description where you can open up your own investing accounts and take your wealth into your own hands. And if you haven't already done so, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to keep on supporting Canadian focused content just like this. All right, let's dive into this information. Like I said before, there's been no shortage of takes from the big big bank economists on the Canadian real estate market. I mean, just look at some of these headlines. They say a speculation tax could quickly break the psychology in the housing market. That's from a BMO economist. And then we flick over here and we see what RBC thinks. They say a housing market momentum could be cooled by a capital gains tax. And we go a little bit further in RBC, or I believe Bank of Montreal actually just came out and said that it, uh, the Bank of Canada is actually the one who is responsible for this huge boost in prices. Now, if you don't already know about that, I made a video on that a little while ago about how the Bank of Canada's policies that they brought in to help during the pandemic have actually caused a huge boom in real estate prices and how a former Bank of Canada governor actually admitted to this fact. I'll link to that video in the description. But now let's get into OSFI. Or OSFI. This, is the, uh, this is the regulator who's actually going to step in now, or at least is planning to, to try to curb the incredible growth in real estate prices. Now, OSFI is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, and they're a non-government related body that's supposed to regulate the big banks and financial institutions right here in Canada. And they were the ones who implemented the mortgage stress test back at the end of 2017. Now, they're actually proposing to make changes to this mortgage stress test, which could have impacts on Canadian real estate prices. But before we go into what is happening now, we need to fully understand what this mortgage stress test did in the past. The mortgage stress test is something that was implemented in Canada's previous housing boom that was around that 2017 timeline. Now, what a mortgage stress test is in its most basic terms is saying, hey, when someone qualifies for a mortgage at a certain interest rate, they not only have to be able to qualify for that interest rate, no, they have to be tested at a higher interest rate as well so that in the event that interest rates go up in the future, they would still be able to, based on this qualification, be able to make their mortgage payments. When this stress test was implemented, people were essentially able to to afford less home than they were able to before because of this increased capacity that they need to be tested for for this uh, interest rate rise that could potentially happen. And what happened to prices at that time? Well, they didn't necessarily go down dramatically, but the growth that we saw in the Canadian real estate market did significantly slow. And take a look at this data right over here in this section right here. So you'll see this is uh, 2017 uh, when there was the, the peak of the previous boom. Now we saw those regulations being put in with this mortgage stress test and that dramatically slowed growth. Now it didn't dramatically decrease prices um, in many markets, but it did keep this growth at a more even pace than the uh, than the 15%, uh, almost 15% that we saw year over year at that point. Now you can see here as we're getting into 2020, 2021, we're starting to see that rate of increase in, um, keep up to those previous levels where this uh, mortgage stress test was initially implemented. And now OSFI is proposing and essentially planning that on June 1st, they want to make these qualification rules even more strict. Now, they're going to change the way that this stress test is actually calculated, but essentially it's going to add up to about a half a percent increase in the higher rate that you would have to qualify for in order to pass the stress test. Now, based on a broad rule of thumb that's largely used in the mortgage industry, for every 1% change in an interest rate, you also see a 10% change in the average buyer's buying power. So this change that OFSI would be proposing, which is a half percent change in the interest rate that you'd have to be able to qualify for, that would result in a 5% change in the average purchaser's buying power. Now, if this is on a million dollar home, that would amount to a 5% change, which is $50,000. Uh, if they could previously buy a home for a million dollars, they would only be able to qualify now for $950,000. But will a change like this actually have an impact on the real estate market? Well, that remains to be seen. And there's actually some pretty solid arguments that 
that could say, hey, this may not actually do anything and it could make matters worse. Let me explain. So this is from the official OSFI press release about this proposed change. And the key thing I want to point out here is that they actually include a hard date that they would want these changes to be implemented. They say that there could be a potential coming into force date of June 1st, 2021. So it would just be like flicking a switch and all of a sudden there would this be this higher qualification that you would need to go through, um, a higher stress test that you would need to pass in order to purchase a home. Now, it's rather significant that they included this hard deadline or this hard date to make this change, because if you're a buyer and you're looking for a house right now and you know it's going to get harder to qualify in the future at a certain date, what's that going to incentivize you to do? You're going to go right out and even try harder to buy a home. So we could see this flurry and this real rush of buyers trying to get in before this change is made, causing even more of a run up in prices as we approach this June 1st date. Now, if we see even more activity in the real estate market with this rush to get in before the June 1st deadline for this change to be potentially made, it could cause even more of a run up, like I said, in the real estate prices. Now, when we see even more of a run up in the real estate prices, that's going to make even more people feel like, oh my goodness, I don't want to miss out. I don't want this real estate market to run away from me. I want to get in now, even though this change has taken place. So what I'm trying to say here is that this increased activity could actually cause even more of a flurry after this change is even made, potentially negating the cooling effects that this change is set to make. Whether or not these kinds of changes will actually have an impact on curbing the rate of growth in the real estate market, well, that still remains to be seen, but it certainly affects residential retail buyers more heavily than other buyers. Remember, that's people who are buying houses for their families, right? They are the ones who are most heavily impacted by these changes. But what about investors? Are they sort of in this same position where they're participating in the fear of missing out idea that's happening in the real estate market right now? Well, Benjamin Tal, the chief economic analyst at CIBC, has some interesting comments on this that I want to show you. About 35% of investors are still in negative cash flow. They basically lose money on a monthly basis. And when we ask them, you're losing money, why are you doing that? They say, no, 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 you don't understand. We are not losing money. Somebody is paying a portion of our mortgage on this unit, and the value of this unit will continue to rise over time. And you know what? <clears throat> They're right. Now, let me explain why I think this is such a significant statistic. You'll remember in there, he said that based on his data, there's around 35% of investors who are cash flow negative. This means that every single month, they're not actually able to cover the entirety of their mortgages and their expenses and their property taxes just off of what they're renting their real estate investments out for to their tenants. So even though they bought this property as an investment, they're actually having to take money out of their pay paycheck or out of their savings and put it towards the mortgage because it's not able to be fully covered by their tenant. Now, this means that it's cash flow negative. If it was cash flow positive, they'd be making money on top of their mortgage and expenses, just as a simple breakdown of real estate investing. In real estate investing, there are essentially three ways that you can make money from your investment. The first one is cash flow, right? Having the tenant pay more than you have to pay on your mortgage and your expenses. That's one way. Way. The second way is for through mortgage pay down. Now the tenant is paying the mortgage on the property and slowly and slowly and slowly the loan that you've taken out to buy the house gets paid down, meaning you own a larger percentage of the house, um, decreasing the amount that you owe on the loan. This is the second way. And the third way that you can make money is through appreciation. And this is what investors look at as the icing on the top of the cake. And this is just the growth in the value of the home over the time that you're holding it. Now, traditionally, the fundamentals of real estate investing are those first two methods, cash flow and mortgage or principal pay down, right? But uh, th this third method is what a lot of people are starting to depend on when really when it comes down to the fundamentals, this should only be seen as icing on the cake. And if you're relying on appreciation for your real estate investment, traditionally, this was seen as speculation and potentially not the best investment. So this is what Benjamin Tal, this chief economist is saying. He's saying essentially over the past few years, especially during this pandemic, people who have been buying real 
estate, even though it doesn't fit the right fundamentals for investing, those first two things we talk about, and I've only been able to exceed based on number three, the appreciation or the increase of the value of the home or the condo or whatever investment they bought, they've been essentially rewarded for not focusing on the real estate investing fundamentals and instead just speculating on the appreciation. And because they've been rewarded for this growth, it encourages them to do it again and for more people to get into this appreciation only investing. And I see this sort of as the investor version of fear of missing out, right? That FOMO. Because people are finding it harder and harder to find properties that fit those cash flow fundamentals, and people are getting okay with just buying into the market with hopes that it's going to appreciate over time. This is the investor FOMO. But what's actually going to be done about all of this, this entire real estate problem? Well, we've already heard from a couple economists on what they think should be done, but will the federal government step in and actually implement new policies that could slow down the Canadian real estate market. Well, Benjamin Tal has some thoughts on that too about the upcoming budget and whether or not something like this could be included inside of it. Well, as you know, there are a lot of speculations. People talk about all kinds of options. I don't think that the government or the regulators need the base street economies to tell them what to do. They know what to do. And I think there will be some measures that will aim at slowing down demand. But the real issue as you suggested, is supply. And this is something that we have to start working on. Yes, it's long term. Yes, it's not tomorrow. And for tomorrow, we'll have to, need to deal with some uh, demand issues. But the big issue in the GTA and other places like Vancouver is simply a lack of supply given a significant increase in demand. So he's saying here that he does expect something to be inside of this budget. Remember, that's going to be coming out on April 19th. It's going to answer questions about so many things about the future of Canada and where it's going to head, whether or not we're going to transition into some sort of UBI. It's looking like there might be a, a federal or a national child care policy put in, as well as these changes to real estate that could come down the pipeline. Now, mark your calendar for April 19th. We're going to be doing a live stream here where we're going to cover what's actually inside of this budget as it's announced for the very first time. But it seems like there's not a one one size fits all solution to the current real estate market. The real estate market's like a big tanker boat, right? And this OSFI change or any other change that's being discussed would be like a tiny little rudder at the back of it. It wouldn't really make the big boat of the real estate market move significantly unless we got a far bigger rudder. Now, whether or not that's going to be something that's included in the budget, that remains to be seen. And it's not like we could just target all of these policies against real estate investors, because I still do believe that it's a positive tool to have here in Canada to help individuals individual Canadians boost their wealth. And as well, if we target in real estate investors too heavily, we could see problems in the rental market. If there's less people buying properties to rent them out, even the, the most low income Canadians who are forced to rent, they may have less options and see rent skyrocket, right? So we really have to be considerate of what these policies are really going to do to multiple things, not just the price of real estate, but also these sort of tertiary markets, the, the, the rental markets and all of this. Like there's so much that goes into it. And I personally am not smart enough to to have all of these answers or to have a vision of where this is all going to go. And I'm sure I've missed some stuff. And if I have, let me know down in the comments. Let me know what you think about all of this. What should be done to change the way the real estate market's going here in Canada? Or should nothing be done at all and we should just let the free market handle it? I read absolutely every single comment that I get and I try to reply to as many as I possibly can. So let me know what you think down there in the description. And of course, if you haven't already done so, check out the links in the description where you can open up your own investing accounts and take your wealth into your own hands. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to keep on supporting Canadian focused content, which let's face it, there's not quite enough of right here on YouTube. And with all that said, thank you so much for watching everybody. I really hope this video helped you out at least a little bit and I'll see you next time. This channel is supported by viewers like you. Thanks, channel members.